a lot of what's going on in the gold guidelines now, I think puts some of the burden on the patient to, to self-manage a little bit at home, do what's right. Um, what, how important is lifestyle modification in this disease? in COPD? Well, it was important for hiding the disease for a long time, we talked about that. But then I think that modifying your lifestyle, smoking cessation, and activities, increasing your activities is really crucial. That's why I really like pulmonary rehabilitation. But doc, doc, I can't exercise, I can't breathe. How could you possibly tell me to exercise? Well, Come because on. I didn't tell you to exercise. I'm gonna talk to you about how we increase your activities. Let's talk about how many steps can you go up now before you have to stop? We're gonna practice so you go up one more step a week without having oh, to stop. Oh, that's exercise. Uh, I yeah, hate exercise. Well, Size. Come on, Doc. You do want to get up and be able to go to the bathroom to get a drink, to eat. You wouldn't like to have to be in that chair and have somebody bring it to you all the time. So I do think you can talk about what they want to do. That's one of the things I think we miss out on is what is it that the patient would like to do? We might formally call it goal setting, but what is it that you want to do that you can't do? Is it going to get the mail? Is it going to the grocery store? Is it playing with a grandchild? Is it walking around the block? Is it being able to go get that beer from the refrigerator during the game? What is it? And then let's work on that as our goal. You know, yeah. So uh, I love pulmonary rehab. In the city of San Antonio, it's the seventh largest city in the country. You know how many pulmonary rehab programs we have? One. Two. Oh, two. One that is by the military, that we can send our veterans there. And there is one that is in the private sector, is a cardiopulmonary. So they are able to be able to get by to the cardiac and the pulmonary. So in reality, that doesn't exist. Which is really terrible. The same thing exists in New York. We have a handful of rehab centers. Rehab does everything you could possibly want without any side effects. And the statistics suggest that barely 3% of COPD patients either have pulmonary rehab available or use it. It's I mean, staggering. There's a huge disconnect there, yeah. right? Really well, but that's it. why I think we need to say it is one of the most effective therapies. It has very few side effects. It really improves quality of life. So what can we learn from pulmonary rehab? What can we learn about educating patients, about increasing activities? Most of us have physical or occupational therapy available to us uh, because of all the knee replacements and everything else. What can we do to use the resources like physical therapy to help patients with activities? Uh, and who can do some of the education for us? So, I mean, I, you mentioned before telemedicine. So while the data is not very good, if we ever hope to get beyond two to three percent, not going to five or 10 percent, but going to 60, 70, 80 percent, that we're going to have to go beyond pulmonary rehab centers in order to get yes. there. I think that's true. But one of the issues I think we need to deal with as we go down that road, Barbara, is I think we need to deal with the isolation issues. Yes. One of the real things which is a benefit of pulmonary rehab isn't just the exercise. So it's, the, it's the familial component yes. to it. We're in this together, yes. you know, and isolation, which is so much of a part of the depression and anxiety in this disease is something that as we move forward, because I agree with you, it can't be then, there will not be pulmonary rehab centers in every, in every, in every, down every block, there won't. So we need to figure another way, but we need to address the isolation. I'd like to walk with, uh, work with the family on this. I, I pretty much throw out the idea of rehab because we can never get it. it. We have it, but again, it's always prioritized to uh, lung transplant or something else. Everybody can walk. Everybody wants to see their grandchildren. And we really need to emphasize the, the outcomes that come with simple things like walking, walking with a wife or a kids or what have you. Uh, my environment, everybody has a dog and uh, they want the patient to walk the dog. The dog will give you the exercise. And again, the isolation is a phenomenally important yes. feature. Well, let me ask a, a very simple nuts and bolts question. Were there a center available? Is it reimbursable to send patients there? Well, it's, the, the problem is the centers are not reimbursed. 
uh, the payers will pay in 45 cents out of the dollar. Yeah. You don't need a Nobel Prize in economics to figure out you're not going to make it. Right. We have. We that was had my question. If you get we reimbursed for rehab, they are not. why wouldn't some entrepreneur set these things up? And the answer because is they are not right. being reimbursed. Getting reimbursed. You know, it, it, it was said, uh, I was part of the COPD Foundation many years ago yeah. uh, with John that we love it very heavy. Uh, we were able to get it right. there, and somebody said, oh, this is not important. They got it out, and they actually were missing the boat, the biggest thing that can have an impact. As Brian said, I, you know, I don't care they go and walk to uh, do a thing. Right. They are together, and they learn how to deal with life. I have one of my patients walks into the office one day, and she says, she said, what's different on me? I said, oh, my, I'm in trouble. I can never figure it out what my wife is right there. <laughs> in, she in, have her in the group, Somebody brought these glasses that the oxygen comes through here. Ah. So for her, it was very important not to have her oxygen cannula in her face. Having those glasses, it changed her life. She could get out. She could do more. And she could learn that while being with peers that deal with the disease day by day. You know, there was, you know, as you know, cardiac rehab has been reimbursed forever. Uh, there was a lot of push by many of us to get pulmonary rehab approved, get a national policy, and it is, exists now. So there are some states like Oregon and Washington that had no pulmonary rehab before. But the problem with that is that while it is quote unquote more available, the reimbursements went from marginal to poor to zero almost. So it's very difficult. So we have a national program now, but none of the available centers. But I think that, you know, also we talked about what are we going to have to do to substitute, and we've mentioned telehealth, we've mentioned walking your dog and other things. But I think that online communities yeah. are a real yes. possibility for this isolation. Yeah. Uh, in rural Minnesota in the winter, you don't go out and walk That's your right. dog because it's dog. too cold and sure. too icy and you're going to fall and you break your hip. You come home with a dogsicle, don't you? Oh, well, a dog <laughs> Mm -hmm. sickle, yes, but with a broken hip from your osteoporosis. Right. So these online communities are extremely important, and uh, the COPD Foundation has one of these, for example, and there are others that can be developed. So I really encourage uh, medical community mm -hmm. and the healthcare community to do this. The other group that I think about the isolation are the caregivers. We forget that many people with COPD that's a little more progressed have to have a caregiver, and that makes them isolated frequently too. They need that support. I, I just want to just want to stress what Barbara says. So the COPD Foundation has created a program called 360 Social. So we have over 35,000 members, and we're getting over 250,000 unique hits a month. So these are people who want right. help. They right. want to join. Uh, it's something that we all need to push forward on. All right. Let, and the other thing with rehabilitation and walking, uh, we do have medicines that work. Uh, and if the patient had access to them, uh, and uh, you know, one of the things in all the, the big trials that we do with developing new medicines in you know, the 25 or so that I've certainly been involved with is that we improve exercise performance. Not like asthma so much, but it is still pretty good. And if we can get people to be compliant, they might surprisingly be able to do a little right. more. So we well, try to encourage them with that, Peter.